Uh, Kate, can you hear me? Sure you use the mic. Thank you. Yes, Kat, I can hear you. Yeah, so if, if in uh, Zoom you can just introduce yourself, that would be great uh, in the chat so that you all can get a chance to meet each other. And uh, I'd love to do the same for the people who are in the room. Um, so I'll start. My name is Catherine Townsend. Um, I spent eight years in the U.S. federal government and have been advising governments in Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, UAE, uh, and local domestic uh, around the world on open data and open data policies. Um, and I work with a group uh, of others who we have various day jobs, um, but because we believe so strongly in government transparency, um, this collective is called Open Data Collaboratives. Uh, so if you would like to follow on with any of these slides or any of the people involved, um, that is the link there. Um, I will say it's case sensitive, so just <laughs> follow it directly. Um, and uh, you'll see I'm here by myself. Uh, others did not get their visas. So unfortunately, many are, um, it's in the middle of the night, they, they may join, but I do have uh, a colleague um, who, who is on and, and supporting. So, um, so thank you all for joining today. I think what I'd like to do is just take a moment to, to take you all through, but it would be helpful for me to understand what roles you're in. Uh, this is a networking event, so the point is for us to really see and meet each other. So do you mind if we um, just uh, go around a little bit and speak about <laughs> just just to say, you know, uh, either what role you're in or why you chose to come to this session, what kind of you're looking for, and, and then I can sort of tailor on what would be most useful. And I just ask those on Zoom to do the same, please. Hello. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Kusai al Shafi. I'm from Kuwait. I'm the chairman of Automated Systems Company, and we are interested in how to sustain. Oh. Uh, we, we, we are mostly int interested in how to uh, govern and uh, sustain uh, open data uh, to government entities because they are our clients. Thank you. Uh, my name is Varuna Dhanapal. I am from the government of Sri Lanka. I am a civil servant for uh, 23 years. Uh, I have also served in New York as a diplomat uh, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals uh, Compost, and I was part of the Open Working Group. Uh, so I found it quite interesting, the subject. So the government of Sri Lanka has many uh, personal data collection initiatives, and uh, it, it finds it uh, uh, very essential to for uh, for. Uh, for data governance models that applies to uh, all all uh, all stakeholders of this subject. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nisha. I'm from the Maldives. Uh, so I'm one of the co-founders of Women in Tech Maldives, a nonprofit organization where which was actually established in order to empower women. But uh, currently, I think we are the only uh, functioning uh, IT nonprofit in the Maldives and. We do advocate a lot for open data, which is why I choose to be in this session because I'm looking forward to learning from you and maybe going back home and you know, trying to get our government and our other officers to implement this. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Shalpa. I am a researcher at the University of Melbourne. Uh, pre before that, I, I am an academic. I used to work as an assistant professor at the Indian University. And my research is on data governance. And I am trying to look data, not from an economic perspective, but from a political perspective. And hence, I really wanted to see the capacity of like how open government data can, you know, protect or, uh, uh, you know, uh, guarantee political values, or m I mean, specifically constitutional values. That's what I'm here for. Hi, um, 
Hi, Sheikh Maha from Maldives. I'm in government, National Center for Information Technology. I'm working in service man IT service management. Hi, I'm Aisha. I am also working in a National Center for Information Technology. It's under the Ministry of Inform Information Technology. So we kind of uh, manage and uh, the government data. We have the data, and uh, we already we are developing systems that are taking and using the, this data. So uh, this this uh, I mean <laughs> session is really good for me to know more about it. So uh, I feel. Uh, <laughs> Maldives. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you all for taking that time. And um, I don't know if I said it, but I, I am from the U.S. That wasn't very evident. Um, okay. And then just to know who is online. Um, I okay. Uh, if if you all want to introduce yourself a bit um, on the on the chat, I'm happy to read out so that others in the room know. Okay, so I just have three examples that I wanted to run you all through of different ways that the uh, people I've worked with and the people on our team have approached government data. Um, so uh, um, to know about our group, who who we're coming from. Um, so we have. Thank you so much. Um, so we've worked, uh, founding members worked in uh, the U.S. State Department, USAID, um, White House on the U.S. open government data policy. And uh, from that, we built out a platform that was shared around the world and really took this to other countries. And, um, you know, what we have been working with is with uh, youth and startups, academics, um, to try to build these uh, coalitions uh, and have about 4,000 people um, across the, our network um, that we engage in fairly regularly. Uh, if I could share anything about the strategy for how this works well and sustained, there's a lot of people who try to change by shouting from the outside and saying you must open data, and then there's people working really hard on the inside trying to convince their co colleagues. Uh, the most effective is to have a partnership where you're working together. So in any way that the government can find people on the outside that are championing the work that they're doing and saying this is, um, you know, this is what we need and we're so supportive, uh, you can use that advocacy to make changes inside government and so vice versa. So that would be the, um, it perhaps it feels very obvious, but finding, finding that uh, collaboration and finding your counterparts is what's going to make um, it work and sustain. So uh, just three countries, and I'm just checking my time here. Uh, great. So uh, the first I'll share, and this it is about uh, three o'clock in the morning for Florence, so I'm sharing her, her slide deck. But uh, this is Florence Tofa, and uh, she has an external organization. So um, sort of she has a women in tech organization in her country, and uh, but built relationships with the government and uh, learned from them that they wanted to build out an open data portal. So I think some of the basics about what is open government data, it seems like you all are working on this, you study it very well, uh, but to just think about sort of the history of the how this came together, a lot of this has been pushed and supported out of the North, um, but it's presented as just a different kind of platform that can be used for uh, government to be responsive to its citizens, to improve service delivery, um, and to have uh, better uh, better partnerships and also better transparency and accountability. It will depend on your context of whether you want to share it as an accountability strategy or, as worked very well in the United States, as a way of uh, supporting GDP growth and making a lot of funds. Um, and that was very appealing to people within government uh, to want to help others to open up data. If you were able to say that we would unlock, or we said a, a trillion dollars worth of growth. Um, uh, currently, there's about 122 uh, countries that have open data portals. Um, there is a group called the Global Data Barometer that takes a measurement each year of the quality of, of uh, data. Um, if there is gray, that doesn't mean that there's nothing. That just means that they didn't include them in the study. There's not data there. Um, 
just to be clear what open data means, uh, it is both technically and legally open. So there's a lot of times uh, that we'll have uh, data available and it's just a sort of a PDF on the website. You can't search for it. It's very difficult to find. It's sort of buried in, but it's called open. So the quality of uh, a machine being able to track and identify and pull in so that people can run their own analysis, this is uh, sort of a baseline requirement for open. I am sure I'm saying things that you all already know, but it's sometimes helpful to just reset, are we all talking about the same thing? Um, legally open. So uh, we have also had many experiences where we have, legally it's open. And what that means is that you have to physically travel to an office and then you have to rent out a book with 1600 pages of text and then you can only read it there and they say, well, it's open. This is, uh, so it, that, that is technically open or that is you know to the letter of the law uh, legally open. But um, it's, it's described as being able to use reuse and to be able to redistribute widely. Uh, here are some of the arguments that we've made in improved social value, public services, more transparent and more efficient government. So this is really something that we find is that open data really improves government efficiency because if you know what you should make public and what needs to be private, um, you really have to organize your own systems very well uh, so that you can make that determination quite quickly. Um, uh, and these are just some stats that have been used by the European Data Portal uh, to make the case uh, when they were developing their own portal. Again, it's truly dependent on the context that you're working in, whether it's regional, national, or subnational. Um, understanding what is going to, uh, uh, what are the cases and what are, the, and now there's so many cases about open data. So what is the story that you need to tell that's going to say that's, um, that's the kind of growth that I want or that's the kind of social change that I want. Um, so uh, this is providing the legal context for open data. Oh yeah, so role of open data policy. Um, so you can do all the work within your teams and, your, uh, and the organizations that you're working with to build up these platforms and to build up these relationships and to open information. But unless you really have either a law that says you must do this by default, or at least a government policy, um, the second someone changes their job, or uh, you know that, that sort of roles and responsibilities shift, all of that work goes away. So in addition to training up how people are working and really getting them on board, you need to have a document in place that everybody can point to and say, this is what we're requiring and this is what our values are. Uh, so this is the portal that they built. This is now uh, about 10 years old. It looks about the same. It is very hard to change. So once you do lock something in place, just know, as you all know, it'll be there for a while. Um, and any time that you do this, it's not just about, all right, we got the law in place and we're requiring them to do this and then they have to. Well, uh, that's not going to sustain. You really, people want to be useful and they want to help for the most part. Um, and uh, so how can you build their capacity so that they feel a sense of ownership themselves? So working to develop that culture of op openness, um, really training uh, people outside of government and also civil servants so that they understand what they're doing and the, uh, you know, how their jobs change day to day and also the social benefits um, of the work that, they, uh, that they're undertaking because anytime you implement a new policy, regardless of the topic, but for sure open data, uh, you have to do a lot more work and it takes time. And if you want a civil service servant to add even more time to their work, um, you know, being able to link it to the social impact that they will have uh, is, is very vital. Uh, this is what a, a methodology that we use. We use hackathons. Hackathons have been around for years the benefit of hackathons, especially with pol policymakers and politicians, is that it is visceral. They can see people using the data. They show up. You can teach them something small about how to interact. I find maps are extraordinarily helpful. So if you have a mapathon, because then they can visually see what they've done. They see the data, then they say it, see it mapped out, um, and then they can feel connected and part of the community. So I think social events are really, really vital. Um, it's also a place where youth are very comfortable. Love that. So I recommend, and you'll see throughout here, we have hackathons in each of these. There's a reason for it. Okay, so that's Ghana. 
um, and this, uh, let's see, this is about 350 students on a Saturday. Um, Florence runs these about once a month. You do not have to have that frequency. She's very impressive with uh, the community that she crowds. But I do think that there is, you know, knowing that there's that consistency, that there's a space to go where people can show up and they can contribute and where governments can show up and they can meet members of the community is really helpful. All right, so um, this is uh, the, the work that I did to come into this space. It's the uh, open data policy um, out of USAID. And we started w with uh, trying to open up agriculture data. Um, and I will say, I'll just to say why agriculture data. Um, in it is important when you're trying to figure out what data set you could make open is to choose one that people will not find terribly controversial. So uh, there's many, any, any data set could be controversial for sure. Land use is very controversial, but um, at least in the context of uh, crop yields and weather patterns, this was seen as much more neutral. So it was much easier to create a prototype about uh, let's open up this data set and just show how the process goes than if we had chosen a data about health or women and children or security, anything like that. Um, so uh, there was sort of an effort to just rebrand, you know, uh, into something called a, a data palooza. So you might see case studies of this. I think we've sort of reverted uh, the language, but there's a lot of this sort of process of not just hosting the hackathon, but actually going through the cycle of opening data, writing a policy on data, bringing the people together, um, engaging with the data, bringing out some prototypes, and then using that to iterate on what the process can be uh, continuing going forward. Um, so this is a hack from, with about eight different uh, countries joined, um, which might seem, you know, uh, at the time, it was sort of before we had a lot of, you know, there's a little Skype, and it was sort of before we had a lot of um, awareness that this would happen. But this was the first hackathon that USAID, that the foreign, uh, foreign arm of the US government had ever run. Um, and sort of from that, uh, we built out a prototype, and we built out a prototype of how to open up data, and we built out the open data policy. So uh, if I were con to condense sort of what those learnings were, um, if you are within government, or if you're working outside and you find your champion, really important to find a catalyst. What you need is a prototype, or a, a paradigm of what it could look like. And once you have a prototype and you have a story, then you can share that around and people will say, that's what I wanna do. How do I replicate that? So you find your, you find your con colleague, you find your contributor, you find your person who is right there with you and saying, yes, let, how do we open this? If you don't have a friend in this, it's pretty hard to do this all on your own. And I don't say that to discourage, but just it's really important to find a friend who to, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of change, a lot of government change happens because you have a small group of really committed people. So um, as I mentioned, try to choose a topic that's not controversial, just to start. You can, you can go controversial later, but uh, try to find one that is easy to tell the story on. Um, Figure out who you actually need to have on your side. It's not gonna be always the people who are first to raise their hand, but you often will need to figure out who, who approves from legal, who approves from privacy, um, if you have a privacy laws and requirements, um, who are the subject matter experts, the people who actually collected the data or who are in charge of it, that you need their approval. And so actually mapping out all of the steps that you would need to go through, really important to build that friend. Um, when I did this, I realized that it would have to go through 47 different people's approval, which is a lot. Um, but even just the act of writing out those 47 steps, we could say, all right, well, this is too much, so how can we tighten this up smaller and smaller? But really building out what that workflow would be from collecting a data set to making it open meant that we could put a, a, a real process in place. Um, I always recommend including media and communications people in the beginning because you need storytellers. Um, and often, especially for those of us who've worked in government, you put do so much work and then you try to share it with the world and hope that everybody's excited. But they weren't part of the process and so they don't own it in the same way. And so I would just bring in their storytellers as early as possible. Um, 
and then making time for implementation and institutionalization. Um, the uh, one of the big flaws that we have for policymakers in general is that we will write a policy and then we will think that it's done. And if you don't take time to actually change people's jobs, change people's work plans, um, then it won't sustain and it won't stick. So all of these things that I've said, there are guidelines, there are job descriptions, there are case studies at that website. Um, it is a US lens, but we, it has been forked and ta taken around the world. Um, so I would definitely recommend it's all written on GitHub, so it's easy sort of to copy and, and share around. Um, but you know, if you're looking at uh, job descriptions or at any sort of guidance on running the hackathons or anything like this, um, that is uh, a location. Uh, and so after that prototype, that development work, we have the development data library, data.usa.gov, um, cuts across all different sectors, and it does sustain. So this was under the Obama administration. We've had a president since then that was not very interested in transparency and collaboration. This stayed online. And it stayed online because there were groups of civil servants that sustained it because it was already part of their work and it wasn't just something that a uh, political group sort of put in place and then left. Um, okay. So I think I've, uh, I've talked through this. Um, again, find the data set and write down each step of the process. Um, uh, I created a working group with the approvers. It was really important and beneficial within USA to actually take notes and share those out around the world. Um, often work happens in silos and or it only happens at headquarters and nobody knows what uh, others are working on. So sort of demonstrating we're working on open data and we're also going to work in the open uh, was really important. Um, and then uh, synthesizing and then, as I said, taking those 47 steps down to eight. Um, and then when you publish, you try to get the public on your side. So for sure you have your external person or if you're working externally, you are the external person. And s as soon as that data goes up, that's when you hit your communications campaign. Isn't this wonderful? Don't we want more of this? Look at all these things that we can do to change it. Because it's not just about that one data set, it's all the other ones that can follow. Um, okay, and then the last example, uh, and just because you've heard my voice chatting for a while, I'm gonna see if, uh, if it's possible for Kate, to, is it possible to have a, a virtual speaker join? Might be a little complicated. All right, we have Togo, Ethiopia on the line, and uh, there's a few others who haven't introduced themselves. Um. Uh, Caitlin Holm. And Kate, I don't know, you have the slides in front of you. It's just about five, and then hopefully we can take the last 10 minutes to just hear from people in the room. but it would be maybe if we have her please step aside. If it's too hard, I can just run the thing. She's unmuted, great. Mm. Kate, can we hear you? Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes we can hear you. Can hear Oh, okay, perfect. Okay, so I will uh, talk to you guys a little bit about some of the work that we did in the UAE, opening up their, opening up and building their um, open data portal called Bayonet. Uh, this was done originally in partnership with the Telecommunications Regulatory Authority, and was uh, was done um, as an initiative. Um, from the UAE, which is a conglomeration of seven emirates. Uh, so this was done as an initiative to bring together some of that very decentralized data that they had in order to create a national uh, platform. And as part of this, we hosted a hackathon for happiness, which was really to helped us to both um, show and establish the, uh, the fact that there was a need for this data, as well as how people intended to use this, because there's always a little bit of a tricky dance with um, 
helping to convince governments to open their data and uh, uh, illustrating one, that there's a need, but two, specifically what types of data might be most useful or most valuable. So in this case, the UAE was really interested in innovation, uh, as well as uh, the possible economic benefits that might stem from that. So this hackathon for happiness that we created uh, in partnership with universities um, uh, took place across all seven emirates and really gave us a large swath of uh, of data on uh, who might be interacting with this uh, with these published data sets and how these uh, how these interactions might produce uh, applications that may have economic benefit, social benefit, or benefit for civil society. So, uh, like I'd mentioned, this hackathon took place with uh, across, I think, about six weeks or so, uh, all seven emirates with universities, um, but it also included people from uh, people from the in people from industry. It included uh, civil society members. So it gave us a pretty large, uh, large uh, data set to pull from. Uh, there were some challenges with building this open data portal. Um, in particular, uh, one of the challenges you can see here um, that we had was uh, converting data between uh, Arabic and English, making sure that both were represented. Uh, as you can see on this slide, these are some of the steps that we followed. Uh, first step was finding the data. This was quite a bit of a challenge because this data had um, the data that had previously been published had mostly been for internal documents or kind of organizational metrics. So we had to go to each of these different uh, ministries or agencies. Some data we got was from like university libraries, really, really uh, uh, difficult to find uh, pieces of information at certain points. Once we did this, though, we were then had to look and uh, explore how that the metadata, so how that information had been gathered, how it had been cataloged. And this was all part of uh, an initiative to, as I said, federate or nationalize the data. So we were combining uh, data from one emirate that may have, uh, for example, let's say it's on camel populations, may have taken this data and only looked at camel populations around uh, watering sources, but there might have been another that only measured camel populations in rural regions or mountainous regions. So understanding that metadata was a real key in order to uh, create, uh, in order to create more complex and comprehensive data sets that included information about the entirety of the UAE. Once we were able to understand that, the next step was to clean this data. Like I mentioned, sometimes uh, these internal uh, documents and metrics were uh, were not always clear or consistent about how they were uh, how they were documenting the the data and what types of like units, for example, they would use. And then we uh, had to convert the data. This is that slide you see now, where or the image you see now. Um, and part of this was sometimes the data would come in, in Arabic, sometimes it would come in, in English, but it was really important that we made it accessible in both English and Arabic. And this could be a bit of a challenge because especially with the um, Arabic font, a lot of programs won't recognize that that is a font or a script. So there was quite a bit of a challenge in figuring out how to uh, either scrape that data or how to input it in a way that would be machine readable across multiple platforms. The next step then was to ensure the quality. Um, and this was done, we had in each data set, we had over 2,300 data sets that were published and in each one, we had a language um, editor, we had two data auditors. And then uh, I personally looked through and viewed every single data set to make sure that uh, this data set matched the initial source material um, and wasn't duplicative of other information that we had we had published previously. Um, last step was sustaining the data, so working with ministries themselves and making sure that they knew how to publish uh, and continue to publish that information. 
Uh, and this links us into the last point here, which was on training and visualization. So part of that was training the ministries on how to continually update their data, why it was important, and how to follow up. And then uh, visualizations came in the form of uh, trainings that are hackathons, how to help students uh, produce uh, visualizations based on the data and metrics they're working. And excitingly, uh, we can see that this project has uh, gone on to uh, be quite uh, quite significant as the UAE has expanded upon this and now developed Bayonet AI, which was trained based on this data that we initially sub uh, put up for work in um, uh, for the for Bayonet. So here's an example of the uh, what it looks like when you the landing page for the open data portal. And uh, you can search here using any of the terms that are included in the data sets in both Arabic and English, as well as tags, which we added as part of the metadata and any of the text in the metadata. Okay, then this next slide, this is actually a picture of us at the hackathon at the Sharjah Planetarium. In fact, you can see Kat in the corner. <laughs> Hi, Kat. Um, and this is uh, this is uh, this image shows one of the teams presenting their work to one of the sheikhs. So then we have, I think, Kat. I'm going to let you take it from here. Is that if there is anything I missed, please feel free to add it. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you, Kate. Um, okay, so just it's a. It's not a terribly complex formula what we run through, um, and it just takes a bit of grit of work and and some time. Um, if the uh, if we were able to start a little bit on time, these is the kind of breakouts that I would ask you for. Um, I think probably uh, the the third, you know, I am happy to help you all, and we are happy to help you all run through any of these. And if you're able to answer these three questions, then it will be we will be even more effective in helping you chase down, okay, how do we get that prototype together? Um, so what data is possible to make open? Um, who can you work with to actually do the work to get that data open? And I think it's really important to tell the story and answer the question. Uh, it's sort of the if this, then that framework. If you open this data, then that impact will happen. So, uh, you know, for example, if we knew about internet quality and uh, cost, um, we could build maps of companies that were supposed to have private that, that service, and then we could allocate funds the way that they're intended to, to improve people's connectivity, something for IGF. But truly, any way that you can get it into this framing, it's, it's so much more impactful if you say, here's how I will apply that data, um, and here's the, here's the impact that it will make. And then, I don't know if the last slide comes up for you. It might need a refresh, maybe the, the deck does. Um, but otherwise, I'll just share it on the Zoom. Uh, it is just the context, and it's, it's just the slide that has the links. Um, yeah, there we go. Great. So these are the links that were shared today, and just context if you are interested and if you want to follow up with any of us, because I know we're at about four minutes. Um, okay. So with that, does anybody have any questions or want to share their experience? Oh, thank you. Uh, it's it's really not a. Qu I don't think so. It's a question or something. But you know, it's it's just. I told you, like I'm I'm researching on data governance, and one of the aspects that I'm doing is open data. And uh, I was doing this particular research, not comparing the models, but then you know, just focusing on Indian and the Korean, the South Korean model of open data, because. I found that you know they have been like doing a fantastic work, especially during pandemic, including I mean India and South Korea have been really promoting open data, including data uh, related to the, the pandemic lockdown and you know people who were inside and outside and all of that, which is why it was easy for the government to track people that you know p if people are hiding and how to reach them in case they n in case emergency. In, in, in situations of emergency, because of course that you know, we realize you know, that it it it's a there's a possibility of being used, all these tools used as surveillance, right? And uh, one of the things that 
I mean, of course, now that's related to like a personal data. But then in South Korea, there was also this particular problem that, you know, Google for many years, very persistent to ask the location of certain kinds of buildings within the geography, which South Korea did not want to uh, reveal for the fact that because of North Korea and the potential uh, damage that, I mean, the potential attack that they could create in their critical infrastructure. So now that is non-personal data. So the maybe maybe the point I would like to raise to everyone who's thinking from the government's perspective, if they want to open data, personal or non-personal, you really need to see your country's uh, goals or agenda that you want to meet and not just follow the model that is going on in every other world because they may have different values, they may have different targets to meet, but what is that you want to do? And the second point I really wanted to, uh, because, because there was this one particular research which happened in India and they were just analyzing that, you know, what kind of data they have been released. And the problem was that the quality of data, and it's not just in India, but it's pretty much everywhere. Yes, it's machine readable, it looks fantastic how it is there. But then, you know, if the data is the 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 juice is actually in the details of the data. If it is not detailed, it is pointless. You are just wasting public resource then. So just having to say that you know, oh, we have an open data ini initiative, but it doesn't do anything because it doesn't give enough information to be used. So which is why, like you know, before opening data, I would say that quality standards, like having standards and ethics is the first thing that a government should work on or anyone that wants to work on. I mean, th that's exactly what happened in India, that you know, they opened data, but then they did not have those values. And now they are this problem that, you know, oh, what do we do with all these things? There is so much wastage of public resource now. So now, but things are getting on track, they're working on these things. So I mean, like that's just a lesson I thought like I could share with everyone. Reaction to that. I do think for sure all of this work is a balance between, um, as, as m many of the themes that we have at IGF, it's freedom of expression, freedom of information, and it's security and privacy. And what looks like personally identifiable information in one context is going to be different around the world, which is why uh, you know, the UN doesn't have a global open data policy that it pushes each country and some t it's e even subnational needs to change. And it's also what seems fine in one government and then you change governments and it is a completely different situation. So trying to start with, again, those more neutral data sets, data sets that are a bit more about what the government does and less about people um, is, is sometimes uh, can be helpful there. Um, and then d for sure on the quality of the data, yeah, they'll you can definitely have insincere actors who check a box, look, we, we did all this work to make it open and now you're still complaining because they will say to civil society all the time. Um, that's where the application is really important. So you don't just have open data for open data sake, we're opening this data in order to apply it here. And so you see that as a whole package of stories. We just don't have it as a research, but here's where it's, it's being um, used in service. So uh, if they are consistently seeing, this is the kind of data that is useful, this is the kind of data that's just fluff, um, then you can make it possible to have some sort of catalyst um, and uh, better examples there. The thing is that uh, government data, although it is a structure, but it is not organized. <laughs> they have the format of a structured data, but uh, actually the data itself is not uh, organized. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, uh, in that case, uh, we are talking about government data. So it is public data. That's what we are looking for. Uh, of economic value, of social value, how to make government, well th the slide that says how to improve public services, uh, uh, transparent government, efficient government. Uh, 
how you would convince the decision maker and, 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 and what controls comes under each line that tells him if this is achieved, uh, if we can format the, the government data in for the sets, again, non-controversial, uh, neutral, uh, available to all, uh, what controls you would apply here or indicator that you will tell to the decision maker, if this is met, uh, you will perform better. Uh, take in consideration the bureaucracy is heavy in the government. You can, you can find dep departments within the same government entity and they don't share data, right? And now you're talking about open data to others. Uh, so uh, uh, you're talking about the top management who may not know the real data within the middle and lower uh, levels, right? Uh, and they need it, and they know that they need it. Um, so how you would convince them that uh, such uh, approach is can be efficient? We do have a law of freedom of information, but uh, to what extent it's an into effect? Uh, that's a question. So I think uh, your question would benefit more from diagnosing, let's try to figure out what the topic is. But I think what I hear is um, what are, who are you trying to convince? So actually identifying who the stakeholder is, and not just government in general, but can you find one team, one leader who has the power to say, I can at least, I maybe can't open up every ministry, but I can open up one section in my ministry's information. I hear that, I hear that, and it's, but yeah. it is hard. And so, and I will say that just one of the things that governments, that companies, anybody, non anybody gets concerned about is that they don't wanna look bad. I, everything is their reputation. So they get very scared of opening up data because they don't want it to be messy and shows that they didn't so do well. And they're very crisp. So now you give them an option where instead of being criticized heavily, okay, let us help you. Let us help you with a good story about how you're being proactive. You're showing your information. You're being transparent. You're bringing in the youth with these hackathons. You're bringing in the community. And then, oh, thank you so much. And, um, and I, it is important to have top down, but you need to give them a story, you, a few examples of here's how we've changed and look, there's stories in the, in the newspaper about how great this is. And I'll just, I'll say, I am sure your context is difficult and I'm sure Sri Lanka is difficult and I'm sure Maldives is difficult. And I can only offer that um, in the US uh, government, uh, the, the offices don't share data with each other. The offices don't organize the data very well themselves. If you ask a Freedom of Information Act, they say, well, we'd have to find that data. It'll cost you $20,000. Do you wanna pay $20,000 for us to answer your question? So it's, there's, there's not a perfect model. There's only all of us trying to build slightly better models for how we can have better government systems. So just to say that it's, um, all of these resources that we're sharing is, is that attempt to try to bring that sort of information sharing into these different spaces that are reticent to do so. Um, so, uh, but are you saying that you don't think it's possible without a top-down approach? Um, how do you would create the commitment? Uh, mm. it, governments are bureaucrats, so they are bad, sure. but they are too much in deep of their bureaucracy, right? sure. their uh, daily work. Yes. Uh, he has uh, 20, individuals or they're gonna come in every day for a license or a permission. He's busy with that because he's there now. Yep. Now we are asking him to publish information. Yep. And so you really have to stretch those in front of each other. Yes, for right? sure. Right? Yes. Uh, he would not realize that publishing the information mm -hmm. would make his life easier. Yep. Either for the beneficiaries of this service or himself as, or his organization. Uh, so bureaucrats are always busy with their daily work. Mm -hmm. They are inside the box, they are not out of the box. Yes. We can. Now, I'm not saying that this is the right approach, but mm -hmm. it is our perception that the, the, 
the, the top leadership mm -hmm. would always see the case because they need information to make the right decision. Mm -hmm. So they would say, yes, we want certain information to be public mm -hmm. and certain information for us to know in the loop yeah. in order to make the right uh, decision. Rather than they say, what's the case here or what's the case there and what's the case here and mm -hmm. wait for a week or 10 days and we need to make the decision yesterday. Right, right. Because the information is not ready for them. Or suddenly there is a crisis or uh, a political issue that just came up mm -hmm. and suddenly he's exposed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, there, there, is no ob there is no mindset for open data. There are yeah. countries that have laws that force government entities to pour data yeah. into a specific format. This format each time gets outdated or, mm -hmm. or that mechanism is, uh, at the time it was done, it was good, but mm -hmm. then there is more data needed, more information needed, but mm -hmm. it didn't get updated or, uh, yeah. and so it becomes old that nobody is now using it and there is demand to modernize it. You're not wrong. It's I see. A, I say the hand, so I just want to make sure that other people can yeah. because it's it, the point is networking. People can help each other. Uh, yeah, in, in the Sri Lanka, there's uh, initiative uh, we joined the Open Government Partnership uh, uh, in 2015 and 16. There's a lot of uh, civil so society activities, uh, acti uh, act activities around it, and the government also responded. Uh, the I think they. Uh, uh, we could uh, submit the second uh, hybrid report into for the 2019 to 2021. After that, I'm not sure of what will happen, but uh, Sri Lanka has a law of right to information. So if, if the data sets can be more open and open, there's no need for individuals to send requests uh, for, for search the paper documents and all other things. So, so it's kind of a win-win situation. So more open you are with, with what government can uh, show to the people who are the stakeholders that uh, less uh, requests uh, in, 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 yeah. in, in particular. I think, I think that's very true. I will say that usually, and if you, okay, so we're just going to close out. Usually if you're looking at the people who submit Freedom of Information Act requests, they want a very specific data set. That, and often it's from a journalist perspective, it's accountability, which is vital. It is hard to get civil servants to convince their bosses to get excited about accountability because it doesn't feel good to get yelled at. And if you want to get people to ex be excited about transparency, you give them a positive story of why it will be in their interest to open it up. And if that is you're helping the youth, you're building businesses, um, you know, there's a nice story in the newspaper or in general, everybody cares about their reputation. And when you build those models, you can shift perception. And then yes, as happened, it took 15 years for the US to do it, but now we finally have a FOIA website that is easy to use as before it was not at all. It does take time. And so it's that nothing that you build today is going to be modern in five, 10 years. And it is about that, those communities and consistency. Um, but it's a global community. There's a lot of people working on this and we wanna work together. So I really appreciate your time.